welcome everyone to our final Institute for the Humanities Faculty Fellow Lecture. Um, I'm Mark Hanuel, I'm Director of the Institute for the Humanities, and I'll quickly explain our procedures for this lecture for those of you who are new to our activities at the Institute. Um, we'll be hearing from Professor Robert in a couple of minutes after I do a proper introduction for him. Um, and after the lecture, we'll be having some casual questions and answers, um, or hopefully answers after the questions. Um, <laughs> he's free to plead the fifth. Um, but um, uh, during the Q&A, you can do one of two things to communicate your desire to ask a question. You can use the hand raise function. Um, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. I've learned these things very slowly. It's on the reactions um, pane, uh, the reaction symbol to the right of your screen, um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can also simply say in the chat that you have a question to ask and I'll call on you. So we'll, that's pretty simple and we'll do the Q&A that way. Um, so uh, you can enable a transcription as well by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. And if you have any further needs um, for accommodations, please don't hesitate to send me a direct message in the chat. Um, so this is our final faculty fellows lecture, although our fellows can rest easy that they still have weeks left in the semester. They have a long <laughs> summer um, that stretches ahead, a happy long summer of research and relaxation to which we're all looking forward. But I would like to thank all of them for contributing to our conversations this year. Andy Clarno, Beata Geisler, Susila Gurusami, Anna Kornblue, Jeff Sklansky, and today's speaker, Jan Robert, for contributing to such a fantastic year of conversations. Um, they have really shown us every single time we get together um, the value of intellectual community, and, um, and we really have appreciated that every single event. And I also want to take advantage um, of this moment to thank all of our audience for joining us for these and other events. We also don't take that for granted. Um, we know that this is a stressful time and we value this so much, our ability to come together, to share ideas and to create the intellectual community that isn't just there, it comes to be through our own collective agency. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank um, the people who helped to put these programs on for us, um, our associate director, Linda Vavra, and our fantastic graduate assistants, Dan Majors and Tierney Powell, who help us with everything from logistics and advertising um, to the, to, just to the mechanics of putting on uh, these events on Zoom and uh, the times that they're in person, um, which we look forward to doing. They help us with all manner of logistics for those events. I hope that everyone will be able to join us for our Spring Humanities Day, when we will honor this year's fellows and welcome next year's fellows, as well as celebrate major awards in the humanities over the past year. Um, there will be other events associated with this as well, uh, screening and of um, uh, Jason Polavoy's new film about Jamal Cole um, and a conversation with the director and producer. Um, it's going to be a small, intimate conversation with the audience about this um, new movie that he's made. Um, and then we'll be um, also uh, having a, a, a conversation about John Modern's new book called Neuromatic, or a particular history of religion and the brain. And there'll be a circulated reading um, that you can request from the Institute. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Jan Robert, Associate Professor of French at UIC. He received his BA, three of them in fact, um, in French, English, and American literature and creative writing um, from the University of Arizona. Um, he also studied at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and at Princeton before uh, where he received his PhD in French literature in 2010. 
His research and teaching areas concentrate on French literature of the 18th century with a particular concentration on theater, politics, law, and the French Revolution. He's author of Dramatic Justice, Trial by Theater in the Age of the French Revolution, published in 2018 by um, the University of Pennsylvania Press. And this is a book that explores the profound relation between theater and politics in the French Revolution. He is also co-editor of Jean-Louis Layard's L'Ami des Lois, a drama that plays a major role in the story that Robert wants to tell about the French Revolution. He's also a founding member of a new book online conversation series for the Society for 18th Century French Studies, the organization where he also serves as vice president, and he is a founding member of the Newberry Library's French Revolution Pamphlets Digital Initiative, a beautiful digital project from which I've personally benefited, just as I've learned so much in my own writing from uh, Professor Robert's advice on all manner of things pertaining to the French Revolution, which of course has a significant place in Anglo-American writing from the 18th century to, well, um, all time. Um, 20 or so articles and book reviews to date Robert addresses a range of issues that pertain to the political, legal, and religious contexts of French literature, from the history of science and religion in Flaubert, um, uh, to the intertwined histories of French theater and French legal procedures, to the significance of French colonialism in the work of Maupassant. He is also recipient of numerous awards for his work, including a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University, a Mellon fellowship at the Newberry, and a Rising Star Award from UIC in the Humanities, Arts, Design, and Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert to speak to us today on the first vigilante, natural law, slavery, and the killer cobbler. Thank you so much, Mark, for this uh, very generous introduction. And I also wanted to thank Linda. Um, Both of you have worked so hard to make this unusual year at the Institute of Success. Uh, My thanks go as well to the other fellows. Uh, The research I'm about to present is completely new, uh, written in just the past few months, and you'll be able to see how much your feedback throughout the year has transformed my work. And uh, last but not least, I'm grateful to all of you in the audience for attending this lecture during such a busy time of the semester. Um, So many, many thanks. Uh, I'm going to now uh, share my screen and uh, to show you a PowerPoint. There it is. Um, And I will uh, get started. The more one reads about vigilantism, the less one understands what it is. Over the years, scholars such as Rosenberg and Setterberg have stretched the concept to cover ever more disparate groups, including nonviolent neighborhood watches, state-sponsored death squads, hate groups, and Hitler's brown shirts. As Eduarda Moncada laments in a 2017 article, Such a definition, I quote, applies to everything and thus explains little, leading some scholars to advocate abandoning the concept of vigilantism altogether. Rather than succumb to defeatism, Moncada engaged in a systematic comparison of earlier definitions in an attempt to return to what he calls a root concept. According to this most minimal, broadly agreeable definition, Vigilantism consists of, I quote, the use or threat of extralegal violence in response to an alleged criminal act. I am drawn to this definition not only for its simplicity, but also because, unlike others, it does not conflict with the popular, i.e. non-academic, understanding of vigilantism, most visible in the ubiquitous descriptions of a vigilante as someone who takes the law into his own hands, and acts as judge, jury, and executioner. These two cliches merit our attention as they reveal much about what vigilantism is, and just as importantly, is not. The first cliche emphasizes that the vigilante replaces official justice to enforce the law. 
This clarifies the nature of the vigilante and of his target. The vigilante must be a private citizen, not an agent of the state, as he would not be deemed otherwise to be usurping the state monopoly on justice. For the same reason, his target must be an individual he believes to have committed an illegal act, punishable as such by the state, and not just a transgression of moral or social norms. This distinguishes vigilantes from hate groups. Both use extrajudicial violence to preserve a particular order, but the former enforce existing laws and punish definable crimes, whereas the latter target ontological categories, violating or exceeding state laws to maintain dominance over racial, religious, or gender groups. In fact, vigilantes often set up popular tribunals that mimic legal discourse and practices, a sign that they seek to temporarily replace, not overthrow, the state and its justice system. This mimetic element gives new meaning to the verb act in the second cliché. The vigilante does not just assume the duties of judge, jury, and executioner. He performs their role, their persona. Acting as judge and jury means embracing the ideal of disinterestedness that defines them. Hence, the vigilante must be inspired by love of justice, never personal considerations liable to cloud his judgment a necessary criteria, lest we be forced to count as vigilantism, the innumerable examples in history and literature of self-defense, deferred vengeance, and honor killing. Acting as executioner, meanwhile, implies that a punishment follows the judgment. Some scholars have stretched the meaning of vigilantism to include any instance of community policing, even in the absence of punishment, as, for instance, when a neighborhood watch catches an alleged criminal, and turns him into the police. Yet, this practice turns neighbors into security guards, not judges, juries, and executioners. Neighborhood watches and hate groups undeniably share some traits with vigilantism, insofar as they are extrajudicial activities seeking to enforce a particular social order. But it is important to preserve them as distinct categories in order to see when one morphs into the other. We thus arrive at a working definition. Vigilantes are private citizens, unconnected to legal institutions, who punish alleged criminals out of a sense of justice, not vengeance or private interest, in an attempt to enforce official laws that a flailing or corrupt justice system have left impotent. As much as scholars differ on the definition of vigilantism, all agree on its date and place of birth. Vigilantism is universally regarded as a uniquely American phenomenon, dating back to the early years of the revolution. The 1767 South Carolina regulators, a group of backcountry property holders who banded together to capture and after formal trials condemned thieves to forced labor and execution, are commonly cited as the prototype for the hundreds of vigilance committees that would hold sway throughout the 19th century in America. So accepted is this account that a recent special issue on vigilantism by the French journal Politiques asked whether it is less a general global concept than an indigenous category, so deeply anchored in the US that the history of vigilantism is nothing more than a quote, the history of an American controversy and its transnational diffusion. And yet, in 1730, decades before the South Carolina regulators, the French priest Jean-Baptiste Labat published in a travelogue a story about a Sicilian cobbler who, repulsed by an inept and corrupt justice system that has let notorious criminals walk free, decides to investigate crimes himself and to execute secretly and summarily, those he finds responsible, ultimately killing more than 50. To my knowledge, Labas Cobbler is the first literary example of a vigilante in France, perhaps even anywhere, as I have yet to find any earlier examples in the extensive literature on vigilantism. And I should say here that I realize this is a very far-reaching claim, and I would truly be grateful if you could prove me wrong during the Q&A by sharing with me some examples of older vigilantes. The story struck a cultural nerve. 
It was reproduced in compilations and newspapers throughout the 18th century, as well as adapted by such prominent authors as Denis Diderot, Louis Sébastien Mercier, Carlo Gazzi, Camille Desmoulins, and Louis Marie Prudhomme. This new day and place of birth for vigilantism not only offers an answer to politique's question, vigilantism is not a purely American indigenous concept. It also calls for a new genealogy. The supposed emergence of vigilantism in America has long been explained by the fusion of certain conditions and beliefs unique to the new world. The ever retreating, sparsely populated frontier made it difficult to establish a permanent and efficient justice system, hence creating a need for vigilantism. Even as the American Revolution offered heavily armed settlers with an ideological framework through which to justify it, notably ideals of popular sovereignty, self-reliance, and the right to resist injustice through violence. Labas Cobbler extricates vigilantism from this purely American context and raises instead a question until now obscured by it. Why does vigilantism seemingly not exist before the 18th century? What are the historical and philosophical conditions necessary for its emergence? One way to answer this question is through another question. What made Labat such an ideal vessel for the birth of vigilantism? Two aspects of his life offer clues toward a new history of vigilantism. First, until the age of 30, Labat studied and then taught philosophy and theology. This training would have made him familiar with contemporary developments in natural law theory that heralded a new vision of humanity, justice, and society. Second, Laba achieved considerable fame as a supporter and practitioner of slavery. His travelogues and memoirs were bestsellers that served as the main source of knowledge on Africa and slavery for Montesquieu and the Encyclopédiste. In what follows, I contend that natural law theory and slavery came together in the early 18th century to give rise to a new concept, vigilantism. Labat's theological readings, particularly those in the Christian natural law tradition, would have encouraged him to think of justice as an innate sense of right and wrong derived from God. This was not a new idea. As far back as Romans 2, 14 and 15, St. Paul had argued that God had engraved the knowledge of universal laws in all human hearts through their conscience. Nor was it a controversial one. The 1694 edition of the Dictionary of the Académie Française defined justice as, I quote, an inner rectitude caused by God's grace. In this view, each individual possesses the ability to serve as judge and jury. But what of executioner? This essential component of vigilantism, Labat could have found in the writings of his contemporary, John Locke, who added the right to punish to the usual list of natural rights, life, liberty, and property. Although Hugo Grotius was the first to reconceive punishment as a natural right predating civil authority, no one made it essential to the very nature of men and to the existence of society as Locke did in his second treatise of government. Describing the state of nature, Locke writes in section eight, in transgressing the law of nature, the offender declares himself to live by another rule than that of reason and common equity, which is that measure God has set to the actions of men for their mutual security. And so he becomes dangerous to mankind, the tie which is to secure them from injury and violence being slighted and broken by him, which, being a trespass against the whole species and the peace and safety of it, provided for by the law of nature. Every man upon this score, by the right he hath to preserve mankind in general, may restrain it, or, where it is necessary, destroy things noxious to them, and so may bring such evil on any one who has transgressed that law, as may make him repent the doing of it, and thereby deter him, and by his example others, from doing the like mischief. And in this case, and upon this ground, every man has a right to punish the offender and be executioner of the law of nature. There's much to unpack in this dense quote, but I will simply note for now that in Locke's state of nature, not only has every man the right to punish, to become an executioner, but this right also extends beyond self-defense, the preservation of one's life, liberty, and property, to target anyone who has transgressed the law of nature. 
the right to punish is unusually vast in law. One need not be the victim of a transgression or directly impacted by it in any way to seek out and execute the transgressor. Yet even as it serves to discipline anyone violating reason and common equity, Locke's right to punish leads to its own unreason and inequity. I quote, In the state of nature there wants a known and indifferent judge, with authority to determine all differences according to the established law. Everyone in that state, being both judge and executioner of the law of nature, men being partial to themselves, passion and revenge is very apt to carry them too far and with too much heat in their own cases, as well as negligence and unconcernedness to make them too remiss in other men's. Only disinterested judges following established laws can ensure just punishment and through it a more reliable protection of the other natural rights life, liberty, and property. In order to establish such a system, however, each individual must consent to surrender his natural right to punish by transferring it to the state, giving the latter a monopoly on punishment. Remarkably for Locke, the only right that one sacrifices in order to enter civil society is the right to punish others for violating rights. This account of the birth of civil society is what makes the very concept of vigilantism thinkable. First, by theorizing a right to punish that is innate in each and every individual. And second, by positing a direct transfer of this right to the state. For indeed, if the right to punish is the only natural right that is alienable, then it stands to reason that it may be recoverable in certain circumstances. This raises the question of when and how an individual's right to punish might be legitimate within society as it is within the state of nature. Locke explores this question through a series of case studies. In the first, a thief attacks a passerby to rob him, a clear violation of natural law. The passerby may respond by killing the thief because the latter's use of force suggests he may inflict an injury beyond repair, taking the passerby's life, making any appeal to a common judge too little and too late. Threatened with imminent unjust force, the passerby thus recovers his natural right to punish. But Locke is careful to stress that this does not mean returning to a state of nature, but rather entering into a different state, that of war. Indeed, the story of the thief appears throughout Locke's treatise as an illustration of the state of war that arises whenever three conditions are met, the use of hostile imminent force, the impossibility of appealing to a common judge, and the likelihood of an irreparable injury. As these conditions made clear, the passerby's violence falls under the category of self-defense, not vigilantism. A distinction Locke underlines by noting that were the passerby to discover a neighbor had robbed him of all his possessions in his absence, he would not be allowed to seek him out and kill him, only to appeal to the law. What distinguishes these two cases is not the nature of the crime or of the perpetrator, but solely the presence of an immediate threat to life and liberty. In the state of nature, no such distinction exists. As we saw in section uh, section 8, that's the first quote on the PowerPoint, anyone may punish a violator of natural law, regardless of imminent threat, since his transgression indicates that he has cast aside the God-given measure of reason and common equity and has become, as a result, dangerous to mankind. The justification for punishment does not lie in the use of hostile force, but in the very essence of the transgressor, who has become noxious, or in other similar passages, a brute, a wild beast, and other terms indicating a loss of humanity. In the state of nature, punishment thus stems from an imbalance of rights. On the one hand, the punisher has full rights to life, liberty, and property, which he seeks to preserve by eliminating a possible future threat, while the violator has zero rights to life, liberty, and property, having forfeited his natural rights as a human being when he broke God's natural laws. Locke never carefully formulates this notion of a forfeiter of rights, but its implications strike me as profound. Indeed, if the full rights of the punisher are transformed upon entering into civil society, he must surrender to the justice system the right to punish threats to mankind, 
retaining only the right to punish an immediate threat to his life and liberty. The absence of rights, or rather their forfeiture by the transgressor, can be retained as a principle in both the state of nature and civil society. In fact, this justification for the right to punish played a key role in the rise during the 18th century of a new definition of a much older concept, that of hostis humani generis, the enemy of mankind. Then Edelstein has shown that under the influence of Locke and subsequent natural law theorists, hostis humani generis came to be seen not just as a threat to public safety, but also as a transgressor against natural law who belonged as a result outside the realm of humanity. Such a monster forfeited his natural rights and could be killed without due process or legal formalities. Drawing on Locke, William Blackstone thus argues that the hostis humani generis, I quote, by declaring war against all mankind, renounced the benefits of society so that every community has a right by the rule of self-defense to inflict that punishment upon him which every individual would in a state of nature have been otherwise entitled to do for any invasion of his person or personal property. Blackstone makes here explicit that in the case of the hostis humani generis, as in self-defense against hostile force, the right to punish found in the state of nature is transferred directly without alteration to civil society, enabling the community to execute a transgressor summarily without having recourse to established laws or judges. Such a punishment may sound like vigilantism because of its extrajudicial nature, yet it remains distinct from it. First, as the Blackstone quote and others like it make clear, the right to punish the hostis humani generis falls to the community or the people, the society, the state, depending on the author, but not to an individual. The execution is thus less a usurpation of the state's right to punish, as in vigilantism, than it is a special application of it, one that bypasses existing laws and procedures. Second, the hostis humani generis designation is limited in scope. Tyrants, brigands, pirates, savages, yes, but not common thieves or murderers. The hostis humani generis does not just violate natural law, he rejects it as law, choosing to live in a state of lawlessness outside human society. To put it in Lockean terms, he declares war on mankind by refusing to recognize the legitimacy of any common judge, making his extrajudicial killing necessary and justifiable. By contrast, there stands a common judge between the vigilante and the criminal he punishes. The criminal may have avoided punishment thanks to an inept or corrupt justice system, but he has not put himself above or beyond the law, nor has he threatened its rule. The vigilante cannot therefore profess to exist in a state of war with the criminal. Rather, he is usurping the prerogative of a judge and undermining the system of law that he claims to protect. In a sense, vigilantism constitutes a radical extension and distortion of the hostis humani generis principle, allowing anyone, not just the community, to punish any transgressors, not just extraordinary aggressors, threatening the very existence of society. Locke explicitly rejects such vigilantism in civil society. Returning once more to the story of the thief, he imagines that the man whose house was robbed is physically or financially unable to appeal to the law or that he does appeal to the law but is denied justice. Faced with inaccessible or inept tribunals, may he take the law into his own hands? No, answers Locke, since his son or even the son of his son may one day renew his appeal and recover his right. By contrast, a people that falls victim to an unjust conqueror has, I quote, no court, no arbitrator on earth to appeal to in order to reclaim its land and may therefore resort to violence. An individual versus a people, a thief versus a tyrant, a common judge versus no judge at all. These are the distinctions that make the first punishment, vigilantism, illegitimate, and the second, hostis humani generis, legitimate. In the end, for Locke, only the preservation of one's life 
gives an individual the right to punish in civil society. I quote, for all force belongs only to the magistrate, nor ought any private persons at any time to use force unless it be in self-defense against unjust violence. Such a rejection of vigilantism is only necessary, however, because Locke's treatise lays out for the first time in history a theoretical framework that makes vigilantism thinkable. As we saw, Locke posits a right to punish natural to each individual, even when said individual is not impacted by the transgression in any way. Then he suggests that this sweeping right to punish may under certain circumstances survive in civil society because the act of violating the law poses an implied threat to the very existence of laws and deprives thereby the transgressor of his own rights under the law, including the right to a former trial. All that remained for vigilantism to go from theory to practice was for an individual or a small group of individuals to claim to stand in for the abstract community and start punishing ordinary criminals in the names of protecting other order and the rule of law. In his Lettres Iroquoise of 1752, Jean-Henri Maubert de Gouvet invites his readers to reflect on a contradiction. I quote, slavery is not known in France. No one, without exception, has the right to render justice himself. He must have recourse to the laws. And yet, in the territories owned by the French Empire in America, the man of the lowest popular class becomes a despot and a tyrant. He can dispose of his slaves' lives as he wishes, without having to fear the laws of his country, nor be tried for murder. Strikingly, slavery is here defined as vigilantism. In the colonies, anyone may punish slaves without going through the justice system, even killing with impunity. By his own account, Labat availed himself liberally of this right to punish. In one story, Labat complains to the governor that slaves belonging to other masters are stealing sugar canes on his land. When the governor does nothing, Labat catches the slaves, interrogates them individually until they admit the theft, and then disciplines them with 50 to 60 lashes each. When the slaves' owners demand compensation, the governor exonerates Labat by acknowledging instead his own failure to enforce the law. In the absence of a functioning justice system, how could he blame Labat for having acted as judge, jury, and executioner? This rationale is what makes Labat's anecdote such a textbook example of vigilantism. In his telling, he only resorts to an extrajudicial arrest, trial, and punishment as a temporary stand-in for an inept justice system. The standard explanation for the popularity of vigilantism in America may thus equally apply to the French colonial empire, which shared with the American frontier an inadequate justice system, hobbled by its distance from large cities and power centers, and by the cost of supporting legal professionals and tribunals. It is noteworthy in that regard that Labat's anecdote takes place after the 1685 passage of the Code Noir, a royal decree portrayed at the time and still to this day as an attempt by the French state to reclaim control over the trading, policing, and disciplining of slaves in the colonies. In this view, the Code Noir sought to limit the near absolute power enjoyed by a colonist over his own slaves and over any slave caught stealing on his property, as in Labat's anecdote. Yet a closer analysis casts doubt on this charitable reading. While the Code Noir does appear to restrict a colonist's right to punish by decreeing that only the state, after a formal trial, may inflict on a slave a severe punishment, death, torture, or mutilation, and even enjoins royal officers to prosecute and punish any master who kills a slave, it immediately undermines itself by explicitly granting the king's power to pardon, no explanation or trial necessary, to officers wishing to absolve cruel masters. Other loopholes also seem designed to preserve the impunity of masters. Condorcet remarks, for instance, that by forbidding slaves from testifying in a court of law, the Code Noir ensures that there will never be evidence contradicting the master's account. The Abbé Renan likewise calls into question the ability of the Code Noir 
to reaffirm the state's monopoly on violence, noting that it has yet to discipline a single colonist for vigilantism, or as he puts it, for insolently usurping sovereign rights by executing a slave. In fact, more than just failing to combat vigilantism, the Code Noir might be said to have encouraged it by extending the reach of the colonist right to punish. Article 16, for instance, instructs all the king's subjects to arrest any slave seen carrying weapons or gathering in groups. I quote, even though the subjects be not officers and there be no warrant against the slaves. Article 21 allows anyone to stop, search, and seize objects on a slave's person. In the earlier examples, the punisher's property was at stake, as when a master executes a slave who belongs to him, or when Labat lashes the slaves who stole from him. Here, however, all colonists are invited to intervene in crimes that impact neither their lives nor their property directly an essential element of vigilantism. Indeed, the Code Noir is evidence in more ways than one of the strength and ubiquity of vigilantism in the colonies. Vigilantism gave birth to it, compelling the state to establish special laws, tribunals, and legal practices so as to reaffirm the primacy of its official justice. And vigilantism gave shape to it, permeating it, leading to articles that are steeped in the power of the master's right to punish. The result is a paradoxical document, a royal decree that performs state power, even as it enshrines vigilantism as a duty of its citizens. The colonial system's social and legal structure thus gives private citizens an unusually broad right to punish, but it also undermines the legitimacy of this vigilantism. The vigilante in its idealized form is a disinterested party who responds to a travesty of justice by punishing a dangerous criminal. He aims to redress a power imbalance, to protect the rights of the aggressed and of the community against an aggressor intent on violating these rights. Yet, in the colonial structure, the right to punish is unevenly distributed and unilateral, given to masters, never to slaves. As the property of another, a slave has neither self nor liberty nor property to preserve. Lacking anything to defend, he has no right to punish. In a fascinating book on the history of self-defense, El Sandorlin depicts colonialism as a mechanism that divides humanity into two groups, proprietors who own not just things but their own bodies and thus have a right to self-preservation, and slaves, non-subjects, their bodies made punishable and dispensable by belonging to another. Dorlin finds the conceptual roots of this mechanism in natural law theory, notably in the primacy given to property in Locke's second treatise. She argues that for Locke, I quote, a subject is constituted and instituted by and in its relation to property and thus exists prior to the act of preserving itself the status of proprietor and of judge, which logically follows, is the condition for the legitimacy and thus the efficacy of self-defense. This definition of the subject creates an essential and essentialist distinction between proprietors of their own selves and thus of the twin rights to preserve and punish, and non-proprietors, slaves, women, children, indigents, criminals, who have no right to defend themselves let alone others through the right to punish. Such a structure alters vigilantism, making it less about redressing a power imbalance than about preserving it. When those with the right to punish, masters, proprietors, use it against those without rights, they no longer discipline an aggressor, they are the aggressor. Indeed, they do not punish a transgression against natural law, but rather an attempt to obey it, an attempt by the slave to reclaim possession of a natural right to life by resisting, to liberty by fleeing, or to property by trafficking. Dorlin overstates the case against Locke, however, who frequently condemns imbalances in rights, as well as, for the most part, slavery. In fact, Locke would have undoubtedly agreed with Maubert de Gouvet's assertion 
that the vigilantism of slave owners turns them into tyrants. In several passages, he likens absolutism to slavery, noting that both create an unequal structure in which the inferior, the slave or the subject, has neither the rights of civil society, the possibility of appealing to a common judge, nor those of the state of nature, the right to resist and punish. Absolutism is accordingly always wrong, and yet Locke identifies one scenario in which the imbalance of rights in slavery is legitimate. While most natural rights can never be waived or alienated, they can be forfeited by committing an act that violates natural law. This absolute rightlessness befalls captives taken in a just war, who, I quote, have forfeited their lives and with it their liberties and may therefore be enslaved, as well as a criminal who, I quote, has by his fault forfeited his own life by some act that deserves death. He to whom he has forfeited it may, when he has him in his power, delay to take it and make use of him to his own service. As the repetition of the term forfeited reveals, what legitimizes slavery is not the rights of the slave owner, but a prior loss of rights by the slave. This is the logic of hostis humani generis, but practiced by the individual, not the state, and applied to a wider range of criminals. It justifies the vigilantism at the heart of colonialism by obscuring its true nature as a system of violence through which proprietors deny the natural rights of non-proprietors, and by presenting it instead as the just punishment that anyone who knowingly transgresses natural law brings upon himself. We can see this strategy come to fruition in Labas' writings on colonialism. As Suzanne Toczynski has shown, Laba is an unusually ambivalent author who even today attracts praise and condemnation alike for his depiction of slavery. While he uses the essentialist language of his time, notably by describing Africans as naturally libertine, vindictive, and prone to sorcery. He also emphasizes their shared humanity. This puts him at odds with many of his contemporaries, and notably with most other supporters of slavery, who often cite Aristotle's claim that there exists a natural distinction between those imbued with reason and meant to govern, and those who, lacking autonomous rationality, are meant to be governed for their own good and that of society. The first theorist of a natural right to punish, Rhodius, had in fact sidestepped the imbalance in rights that troubled Locke by inscribing it within nature itself through the assertion that, I quote, Aristotle is not mistaken when he says that certain persons are by nature slaves. Labat rejects the claim that the Africans' lack of reason and superhuman strength indicate that they do not fully exist within the realm of humanity that like beasts of burden, they were not blessed by God with an innate understanding of natural law and thus with natural rights. Africans have more intellect and good sense than we imagine it, he writes, and far, more, and far from missing a natural sense of justice, theirs is highly developed, leading them to accept deserved punishments with astonishing calm and respect, but risk their very lives to resist even a small unmerited reprimand. In fact, as we will see, Laba presents the tribunals of Africa as superior to their European counterparts, since better aligned with natural law. How then does he justify slavery? Through quite the paradox. For Laba, it is precisely because Africans are human, because they have a sense of justice and natural rights, including the right to punish, that they can be enslaved. He notes that there exist four types of slaves, convicted criminals, prisoners of war, personal slaves of African kings, and ordinary men, women, and children abducted by slave hunters. The latter scenario is the most common, and this troubles Laba so much that he invokes a recent debate at the Sorbonne that examined whether it was morally acceptable for a merchant or colonist to acquire a slave that had not been, I quote, sold for a legitimate reason. I was able to find a summary of this debate in one of the many dictionaries of moral quandaries published throughout the early modern period. Mixing biblical exegesis with the language of natural law, the debate ended on a mixed verdict, 
stating that both divine and human law permitted slavery in theory, notably as a punishment for criminals and enemies captured in a just war, but not in the way it was practiced in Africa and the colonies. The president of the tribunal for cases of conscience at the Sorbonne, Germain Fromageau, which is perhaps the most French name and occupation in history, um, stresses, for instance, that wars on the African continent are rarely just, with most conducted solely for the purpose of obtaining more slaves. Likewise, since I quote, nearly all the laws in these countries are tyrannical, the condemnation of supposed criminals cannot serve as a basis for their enslavement. Fromageau concludes that there's nothing immoral in selling or purchasing slaves, but only if one is truly certain that they were justly enslaved. Labat reproduces this line of reasoning in his memoirs by distinguishing between legitimate and illegitimate reasons for selling a person. Like Fromageau, he considers anyone captured by slave hunters or as a consequence of warmongering to have been wrongly enslaved. Tellingly, however, he rejects the claim that African law and tribunals are tyrannical. On the contrary, he places great faith in their justice, thereby maintaining the legitimacy of one of the four types of slaves. Few authors indeed have written as extensively and favorably about the tribunals of the different African nations. Certain elements always seem to return in Laba's descriptions. Picture an esteemed ruler or, or trusted community elder who listens attentively to the two parties. Accused and accuser speak calmly and concisely with, I quote, natural eloquence and natural common sense, not once interrupting each other. No lawyers, clerks, or prosecutors, and no complicated procedural forms or appeals gum up the judicial process. As a result, the verdict is prompt, and its justice accepted by all, because it is based not on arcane laws, but on the moral conviction of a respected figure in the community. Where the death penalty is warranted, the judge commutes the sentence to slavery. Nabat found all these elements in the ethnological accounts of the Congo, Matamba, and Angola by the Italian priest Giovanni Antonio Cavazzi, which Nabat translated and published in 1732. Yet whereas Cavazzi condemns such trials as neither consistent with justice nor with reason, because their speed and the absence of procedural forms and established laws make them too susceptible to fraud, Labat offers a diametrically opposed interpretation. Drawing on the golden age topos, so often employed by natural law theorists, including Locke, Labat depicts the fast and simple trials of African societies as primitive, but in a positive sense, that is, as closest in time and spirit to the peace and justice of the state of nature. For instance, he notes how fortunate Africans are that they do not yet know point encore, of lawyers, clerks, and other vermin. One of several instances where Nabat compares African tribunals positively to the more institutionalized courts of Europe in a way that inscribes them in the peculiar temporality of the Golden Age narrative. The more one progresses, the furthest one gets from simple nature. This leads him to conclude that the tribunals of Africa are more closely aligned with the laws of nature than their artificial counterparts in Europe. Who better then to determine when a criminal has violated natural law to a degree that justifies his enslavement? And here uh, is an image of this natural law tribunal uh, taken from one of Laba's books. And you can see the similarities with the image on the right that shows another golden age topos, uh, the French king Saint-Louis in the 13th century uh, dispensing justice directly to his people in you know, the same natural setting, the same simplicity, uh, even the same postures. Criminality has, of course, a very long history as a justification for slavery. The concept of penal slavery has always been particularly appealing to slave owners because of how easily it can be defended on utilitarian and humanitarian grounds. Sir Thomas More, for instance, built much of his famous utopia around the notion that capital punishment should be replaced by slavery so as to make the criminals work for the greater good of society. Supporters of slavery also commonly claim that they were saving the lives of Africans sentenced to death, 
leaning and outraged from d'Orsay to inquire whether they would admire a man who, after rescuing someone pursued by assassins, proceeded to rob him of everything he owned. Indeed, abolitionists often reserve the special fury for the penal justification of slavery. The Abbe Renal asked in mock disbelief, are you then the executioners of the peoples of Africa? A question that draws its power from the infamy of executioners in the early modern era, as well as from the deliberate ambiguity of the preposition of, which captures the dual position of French slave owners, at once punishing Africans and punishing for Africans. The latter meant doing an inferior people's dirty work. To quote Théophile Mandar, shame on us. We, the legislators of nations, become their executioners. How can the French merely enforce the laws of Africans when they have more enlightened laws to impart as legislators? This is not just a matter of national pride, but also of justice, according to Renan, who argues that since African nations are despotic, their subjects, I quote, live in a state against nature, making their supposed guilt impossible to confirm. Renan and the Sorbonne thus surprisingly agree on something. African tribunals are tyrannical, and as a result, executing their arbitrary verdicts turns one into a tyrant as well, the same term Maubert de Bouvet uses to describe all colonists. Laba reproduces this line of reasoning, but he inverts it. If African tribunals embody a simpler, more natural form of justice, then slave traders and owners become the executioners not just of African laws, but of the very laws of nature. This sets Laba's defense of penal slavery apart from the usual humanitarian or utilitarian claims. The Europeans are entitled to enslave, not as an act of generosity, because doing so saves a life or labor that would otherwise be lost, but as an act of punishment, because someone who has committed a violation of natural law grave enough to lose the right to life has also forfeited the rights to liberty and to property. Laba thus uses the Lockean logic of a forfeiture of rights to justify not only the initial enslavement, but also the subsequent series of punishments at the hands of the colonists, since the forfeiture makes the imbalance in rights both legitimate and permanent. In this view, a colonist can justly acquire and then punish slaves, not because they are essentially other or inferior due to being black or foreign or born to enslaved parents, but rather because they have made themselves punishable through their actions. This enables Laba to invent a more idealized version of vigilantism than the one practiced in the colonies, one in which the vigilante does not exclusively target the propertyless, but rather seeks to right a wrong by enforcing with impartiality the decrees of natural law. Remarkably, Laba himself calls attention to the distance separating this idealized notion of vigilantism from its actual practice by the colonists. He readily admits that the vast majority of slaves were never convicted of a crime, but simply abducted by slave hunters. One of his own slaves tells him the horrific story of his kidnapping, and Laba believes him, but does not proceed to free him. Nor is Laba alone in this hypocrisy. When a priest arrives in the colonies to report on the debate at the Sorbonne, the colonists all reject Fromageau's decision on the grounds that, I quote, the doctors who were consulted had neither homes on the islands nor investments in the slave trading companies, and that they would have decided entirely differently had they been in one of these circumstances. There can hardly be a clear admission that slavery is solely motivated by property and commerce. Why then does Laba advance the myth of natural law tribunals, forfeited rights, and penal slavery? One likely answer is projection. Maubert de Gouvet, Renal, and even Locke describe as tyrants those who own and punish slaves. Indeed, in the 19th century, the slave trader would officially join the tyrant among the small ranks of the hostis humani generis. Labas' focus on the slave's criminality and resulting loss of rights reverses the roles. Now it is the slaves, not the masters, and certainly not Laba himself, 
who are the enemies of mankind. This role reversal plays a vital part in the rise of vigilantism because it sets up a model and precedent for punishing ordinary criminals outside of the justice system, despite their posing no real threat to mankind or to the rule of law. Natural law and slavery thus provide the context for Laval's killer cobbler. Perhaps the world's first vigilante story, it bears striking similarities to the idealized vigilantism Laba conceived as a justification for slavery. The cobbler's actions may seem indefensible. With his miniature crossbow, he hunts and executes more than 50 criminals. But to Laba, they are proof that even in Sicily, I quote, some people have honor, religion, and virtue, and love justice. After all, the cobbler kills solely out of a zeal for justice, a phrase Laba also uses to describe the motives of a second lesser cobbler who only dispatches 36 criminals. Moreover, the cobbler takes the law into his own hands reluctantly, only after observing that the ineptitude of the legal system is inspiring further crimes and making it impossible for virtuous citizens like him to rely on the proper channels of justice. When the viceroy demands that the vigilante turn himself in, offering immunity and 2,000 gold coins in exchange, the cobbler obeys, but transform what should have been a confession into a critique of the viceroy's lax justice, berating him as follows. I only did what you were supposed to do. You are guilty of all the evils committed by these scoundrels because you did not punish them. You deserve the same punishment that I inflicted on them, and I found more than one opportunity for it. But I respected the person of the king whom you represent and who is answerable solely to God for his actions. As this passage makes clear, the cobbler views his actions not as a challenge to the legal system, but as a temporary replacement for it. I did what you were supposed to do. He notes that the viceroy is himself a proxy for the highest judge in the land, the king. Etymologically, viceroy means in place of the king, making him simultaneously replaceable and punishable when he fails to enforce the law. Amazingly, the viceroy responds by conceding that the cobbler would have been in his right to kill him before thanking him profusely for having spared his life and giving him the 2,000 gold coins. Such a response is reminiscent of Laba's earlier anecdote in which a colonial governor had absolved Laba of any guilt for punishing slaves because he had first appealed to the official justice system for help and found it lacking. In both instances, a high-ranking state official recognizes the legitimacy of vigilantism, even rewards it when it serves as a corrective to an ineffectual justice system. In fact, the story's happy ending extends beyond the cobbler to the entire kingdom. The viceroy discovers that judges and lords have been protecting thieves in exchange for a share of the loot. He publishes an ordinance stating that lords would henceforth be held personally responsible for the thefts and murders in their jurisdiction. Within days, crime almost completely disappears. The cobbler's vigilantism thus strengthens the justice system through its example, before disappearing like the cobbler himself once it is no longer needed. As this ending makes clear, the cobbler is a vigilante, not a revolutionary. He has no desire to overthrow the state. On the contrary, he spares the viceroy out of respect for the king, who he asserts will be answerable to God for his actions. In the cobbler's eyes, God thus serves as the ultimate source and arbiter of justice. Such is also the view of the people of Messina, the vast majority of whom, according to Laba, applaud the cobbler's killings, which, I quote, they regard as the effects of a divine justice that punished the crimes that human justice had left unpunished. God's supreme justice here provides a basis and justification for extrajudicial punishment, much as it does in Locke. Indeed, John Simmons is right to defend Locke against those who accuse him of believing that anyone is morally entitled to inflict bodily harm simply for felt wrongs. As Simmons emphasizes, the right to punish is not for Locke a matter of feelings or subjective interpretation. Rather, each individual has been authorized by God to act as an agent of God 
in enforcing the laws of nature inscribed in his heart by, you guessed it, God. Locke thus never doubts that there exist objective standards for what constitutes guilt and a just punishment. He briefly considers the prospect of wrongful punishment, but only to denounce it as itself a violation of natural law, punishable as such by other individuals. Moreover, he repeatedly warns his readers that reclaiming a personal right to punish in civil society amounts to, I quote, an appeal to heaven. An individual may resort to an extrajudicial punishment when no common judge can be found, but the judge in heaven holds a universal jurisdiction, ensuring that anyone who punishes arbitrarily faces not only the retribution of his peers, but that of God as well, to whom he has unjustly appealed. Such is, this, is the infallibility of God's tribunal that few will dare appeal to it without being certain of the righteousness of the punishment they inflict. Labaz Cobbler exemplifies this. He limits his executions to powerful men who openly flaunt their crimes, whose guilt is so evident that the people of Messina intuitively understand that their deaths do not violate God's natural laws, but on the contrary, uphold and enforce them. For the pious Laba, vigilantism finds its origins and its end in God. By contrast, as we will see in chapter 3, later rewritings of the cobbler story by Diderot and Mercier erase all mentions of God and divine justice, creating a far more ambivalent tale that examines critically the legitimacy of extrajudicial punishment and its impact on civil institutions and laws. No such questions plague Laba's story. Its happy ending capping a remarkably positive portrayal of vigilantism that reflects the French priest's perception of the cobbler as a necessary and legitimate vessel for divine justice. Labas' cobbler story thus echoes the idealized vigilantism he conceived as a justification for slavery, except for one fundamental aspect. However much Laba tries to rationalize it away as a consequence of a criminal's forfeiture of rights, the fact remains that in the colonial system, the right to punish lies exclusively in the hands of a white property elite who uses it to protect the socio-political structure on which its fortune and status depend. The cobbler story flips these roles, with the vigilante now belonging to the working class and his victims to the property elite. Indeed, the humble cobbler specifically targets those who have employed their wealth to nefarious ends. The murderer who bribed his judges, the abductor rapist who abandoned out of greed the virgins he had dishonored, the countless embezzlers and monopolists, in short, all those who, I quote, occupy too lofty a sphere for anyone to reach them. With the cobbler, Laba gives birth to the archetype of the vigilante hero protector of the defenseless against those who abuse their power. Such vigilantism has a strong egalitarian streak. In its origin, the Lockean notion that all men possess the same rights, including the right to punish, as well as in its ambition to ensure that justice is dealt to all equally, however lofty is one's sphere. Avenger of virgins, champion of the destitute, the cobbler represents the kind of disinterested heroic vigilante that is easy to admire, much more so certainly than a wealthy colonist mutilating slaves for having stolen a few sugar canes. Yet one is fiction, the other reality. This is why I believe it is vital to write a new genealogy of vigilantism, to uproot it from the simple explanations of a specific time and place, uniquely American traits or geography and expose it instead for what it truly is, a narrative veil concealing structures of economic domination. I am not the first, of course, to claim that vigilantism is at its core a conservative enterprise aiming to protect the interests of the property classes. Back in 1971, Patrick Bates Nolan observed that vigilante movements have always been led by men of wealth, property, and influence because they are the members of the community with the greatest stake in preserving the status quo. For vigilantism to have emerged not out of the American Revolution or frontier, but out of slavery, is therefore not surprising, 
since slavery makes the division between the property and the property less, more evident, permanent, and violent than any other social structure, notably in its treatment of the property less as property. What is more surprising, and for that reason interesting, is that vigilantism comes into being not only as an extrajudicial system of punitive practices designed to maintain the division between the property and the property less, but also as a theoretical concept that seeks to obscure that very division. Indeed, by focusing on criminality instead of property, vigilantism makes it possible to recast racialized economic oppression into a just punishment against violators of God's law, a punishment in keeping with the wishes of the Africans themselves, since it was their natural law tribunals that convicted the violators in the first place. Drawing on the natural law tradition, vigilantism establishes an intellectual framework that grounds slavery not in property, but in rights. The slave isn't rightless because he is property. He is property because he is rightless, because he forfeited his right to life and liberty through a criminal act. In short, vigilantism as a concept appears to have been invented so that colonists could pretend that slavery was not about race or economics, but about justice. This origin reveals the complicated dual nature of vigilantism, at once an instrument of economic domination and a means of diverting attention away from that economic domination by veiling it in the language of justice. Laba's cobbler story exemplifies the way that vigilantism becomes a narrative veil meant to conceal that the right to punish, even in liberal thinkers like Locke, is inseparable from the idea of property and from the desire to protect those who have property and thereby rights from those who have neither. In his fiction, Laba detaches vigilantism from property, not only by making the vigilante a poor cobbler rather than a wealthy slave owner, but also by depicting his actions as an effort to shield society and its laws from the corrupting influence of property. Underpinning this heroic form of vigilantism is a vision of justice as an egalitarian institution with fixed laws and forms designed to ensure that individuals of all economic status receive the same treatment. The vigilante hero intervenes when a society fails to meet this standard of impartiality. He reluctantly assumes the role of the justice system, not to disavow the state's monopoly on punishment, but to protect it and to extend it to all its citizens. He punishes the oppressors, he aids the oppressed, because such, in his view, is the function of the law. The reality beneath the veil is, however, less flattering. It is true that, like the cobbler, real-life vigilantes seek to enforce the law in situations where the justice system is non-existent or inept. But they do so in the understanding that no matter its claim to impartiality, the law is designed above all to protect the interest of the rich. And here I can't resist sharing one of my favorite quotes uh, about the law. The law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. Be it bread or sugar canes or horses in the far west or slaves stealing themselves by escaping, vigilantism, like the justice system it replaces, has historically targeted property theft above any other crime, with the aim of maintaining order and the status quo, or to put it differently, of preserving existing inequalities. Yet in fiction, the first vigilante hero, Labas Cobbler, inaugurated a long tradition of masked avengers and superheroes, fighting crimes of the rich, not crimes against the rich, and punishing powerful murderers and rapists, not common thieves. Even today, we mainly see two types of vigilantes on TV. In fictional stories, heroes in the mold of Zorro, whose motto is, I quote, to avenge the helpless, to punish cruel politicians, to aid the oppressed. And in the news, vigilantes like Kyle Rittenhouse, 
who killed two protesters in Kenosha in order to protect a car dealership from property damage. These two figures may appear to have little in common. To suggest otherwise may even seem distasteful. Yet the new genealogy of vigilantism that I have delineated here reveals that they are intimately connected, that the Batmans of our cultural imaginary exist to distract us from what is in practice a reactionary, property-obsessed form of violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, I'd like to open everything up for um, questions from the audience. And as I was saying before, feel free to use the hand raise function or just let us know in the chat that you would like to ask a question. Um, I'd be happy to start things off, Jan, um, maybe with the, you, you are asking for the sort of uh, connection with respect to history. And I was, you know, if we had ideas about historical connections. And I was wondering if you have delved back into um, the ballad tradition um, going back to the um, 15th, you know, 14th and 15th centuries to look at these representations of crime and punishment there, you know, I'm thinking, you know, in that I don't know the French tradition at all. I just know um, the English tradition, which was very popular in the 18th century, both as a locus of citation, but also as a node of differentiation, thinking about crime and punishment. And I'm, I guess I'm thinking about in particular, the ballad of Chevy Chase, probably dating back, you know, the dates are fuzzy on them, but, you know, probably um, 15th century. And, you know, having to do with the violation of property, um, the Earl of Northumberland going onto the property of the Earl of Douglas and the Earl of Douglas, you know, just bashing the, the, the Earl of um, Northumberland. And so, you know, it, it would be interesting just to hear what you have to say because it doesn't, you know, it sort of does and doesn't fit into the paradigm. And one of the reasons why I was wondering what you might have to say about that is um, simply because of the rise of discourse about the common law. Um, what, you know, the, you, you're talking about a, a literary production that comes post Blackstone, post Locke, you know, post all kinds of thinking about what um, statute law is, what common law is. And, you know, for all we know, um, that's not quite the world that um, the anonymous writers of these ballads, you know, we don't know the right, you don't, we don't know the authors of the ballads, but, um, but it's not quite from that world of overwritten and overdetermined legal discourse. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm going to start with pleading the fifth immediately, <laughs> since you gave me that permission. Uh, I, I, I mean, this, these aren't texts that I'm familiar with. Um, the way you describe them, uh, at least the, 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 the ballad that you described, uh, doesn't sound like vigilantism in the sense that um, there is a personal interest in recuperating that land that was stolen. Uh, and so in that sense, um, it, it would fall more under the category of a certain type of, of self-defense, but uh, a self-defense that Locke would frown against um, because he would say that if, if your life is not under immediate threat, you should go through the justice system. So in that sense, it remains vigilante-like. Um, but um, I'm really interested in those in stories that involve a vigilante um, who stands n to gain nothing from his actions and is solely motivated by some abstract notion of justice. So um, it doesn't, you know, sort of perfectly 
uh, fit. Uh, and I see Andy Claro mentioning uh, Don Quixote, and, and that's another one I've been thinking of a little bit. I think I see Don Quixote as more of the sort of protector of innocence, but without necessarily the punitive aspect of sort of investigating a crime and, and, and executing the person. Um, but I'd have to, to look at it more closely. Um, I will say that the text I'm looking at um, in this particular chapter, which is to say, um, particularly the, the cobbler story and uh, all the sort of uh, travelogues and memoirs of uh, colonialism that Labat write, um, are from are between 1715 and 1730. So they are post Locke, uh, but they aren't post Blackstone. Um, and I think that may be important in ways that I haven't figured out yet. But um, I think that he has a familiarity with Locke, but he would not have had a familiarity with Blackstone. And this is also, and it's important for me, a pre-French uh, Enlightenment campaign to reform the justice system. So pre-Bricaria, pre-Voltaire, uh, getting involved in the Calas affair and so, so forth. So, um, you know, this is still in Labat, very much a kind of um, a focus on, on the divine notion of justice um, that leads to a type of vigilantism that isn't problematic. Uh, and uh, what I plan to show in the book that later on, it becomes much more problematic once you take God out of the equation and you focus uh, more specifically on the relationship between uh, an individual acting like a vigilante and uh, the institutions in which and the society in which he's, he's um, um, acting. Um, so I, I don't have much to say about those ballads, but I will take a look at them. And, um, and I'm sort of simultaneously hoping that they will have many vigilantes and hoping that they will have none so that I can keep claiming I have the first. Um, but. Well, yeah, the, it was actually, um, the, my question actually was with the assumption that in fact, the distinction is a powerful mm -hmm. one. Um, yeah. While there are these acts of vengeance, they're not, they don't quite line up, but they're, they're interestingly related, perhaps. Um, we have some questions that are coming in, Imka. Yeah, thanks so much, Jan, for a great talk. I'm very much persuaded in particular by the reading you presented towards the end where you say that what is at stake in these debates are economic interests. And um, I find it very interesting if we relate what you said to the, um, the former guys, uh, administration's attempt uh, to rethink human rights and uh, yeah as we all know Mike Pompeo instituted this uh, commission on unalienable rights to which he also appointed um, shockingly and uh, very controversially two Germanists you know from from my field um, Russell uh, Berman and uh, David Pan um, who um, I guess had uh, credentials that um, Pompeo and his uh, minions liked. But in any event, what to me is very interesting is that this report that this commission then published, of course, elevated two rights <laughs> as the rights that sort of trump all other human rights, namely property rights and religious freedom, right? And just, I think maybe it was a couple of weeks or so ago, we had Anthony Blinken, who thankfully is now in charge, saying that um, basically he had no intention whatsoever to rely on this document that the commission uh, assembled for any sort of guidance. But of course, it was a return in this, uh, it was an attempt that this document made to return to a sort of notion of, of natural law that can then uh, nevertheless enframe property rights of all rights as the uh, uh, most important one. And of course, you know, it has an impact on uh, things like these stand your ground laws and uh, these castle laws, my home is my castle, right? So somebody uh, sets a foot on my, my lawn and uh, damages my 
grass sprinkler or whatever, I, I get to shoot him. Or you have the George Zimmermans of the world, right? Patrolling uh, largely white neighborhoods to see whether anybody who dares wear a hoodie is walking around there and stylizing himself as a vigilante, right? Um, so, and this all, you know, again, I'm just very persuaded by your arguments um, that this all goes back to um, economic uh, interests, right? And so it, it, I find that um, in particular under the former guy, um, this, these property rights were then yoked again into a uh, sort of racialized framework. So I'm very interested in your elaboration of the origins um, of these discourses also in uh, slavery. So anyway, I just basically wanted to get your take maybe on uh, property rights in this country and uh, yeah, or may, you may not have any, but uh, maybe you do see a connection. No, thank you. I mean, I, I definitely see a connection. Um, the the book I briefly mentioned by uh, Elsa Dorlin, Se Défendre une Philosophie de la Violence, uh, I don't know if it's been translated into English, but it is a really brilliant book that um, studies um, particularly the American context and, and traces a lot of these issues to uh, Locke in particular and to the obsession with property in Locke, uh, which you know, for, for a very long time, I think people read Locke and focused on the, the sort of the liberty and the influence on the American Revolution, et cetera, um, and read it through this sort of very liberal lens. Um, and she tries to, to, to sort of tease out from the text the fact that the natural law tradition that we think of as uh, an issue of, of, of human rights, of, of liberation, um, actually is, is, is very closely focused on uh, one particular right in, you know, above all, that of property. And that from this uh, division of, of those who have property and those who do not, uh, gets built an entire system of economic domination that she then sees in, in slavery, but she continues to trace it and, and she makes America the sort of center uh, of that, of that um, uh, structure of domination. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I find it very compelling as a reading for virtually everything that um, we have seen in the past, uh, you know, four years pre-Biden. Uh, uh, and, and even now, I was shocked, I think it was just a week ago or maybe two weeks ago, the New York Times um, did a study and then published the results and were shocked to find that um, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th uh, were mostly from uh, middle or even upper middle class backgrounds. And their conclusion was, well, Maybe we need to rethink the idea that Trump's support was primarily, um, you know, uh, working class white men uh, who had been left behind by the system and, and were uh, seeking to, to, to break the system, to revolt. And, you know, I, and they said, well, maybe actually he had tremendous amount of support from the ones who had a great deal of property and were actually concerned by the rise of uh, racialized communities and, and documented immigrants, et cetera. Um, and, and that to me is, is um, I was interested first by that surprise, as if it was like, wow, how strange that these men who in many ways are vigilantes or thought of themselves as vigilantes in the sense that they really believed the election had been taken from them and that they not, you know, they were not in their own mythology uh, insurrectionists trying to overthrow the government. Uh, they believed that they were protecting the government, enforcing the constitution, etc. And, you know, the, the surprise that, oh, but, but they had property. But in fact, you know, what I'm seeing is that the vigilantes almost always have property, uh, property that they're seeking to protect. Um, so you can look at much of the, of the sort of Trump movement um as as a kind of form of of um of vigilantism um but so no i i, I completely i mean i'm i'm thoroughly 
convinced by that. Um, and uh, my my sort of sense uh, as as sort of we, um, I mean, my main advice would be, uh, you know, if th these are interesting topics to you, to look at that Ed Sadorna book because um, it's she just she, she follows it all the way through, and she actually ends with a chapter on the on the Zimmerman case, looking at um, this sort of this uh, in this case very American notion, the one that has spread throughout the world of of um, stand your ground and, and this sort of strange idea that. Um, you know, property somehow trumps uh, life and liberty. John. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that was a, a fabulous talk. Uh, and I, I, I'm really curious about how the how the debate evolves throughout the the, the 18th century, because after all, I mean, uh, the, it, you know, slavery is abolished, um, and then of course it's rather um, uh, precipitously reintroduced by Napoleon, um, uh, and uh, of course um, uh, once uh, Haiti agrees to pay indemnity <laughs> for the loss of property. Um, the the uh, um, that is allowed, but what I was I remember being absolutely astonished to discover um, that that France was still accepting, in fact, requiring an indemnity from Haiti into the twentieth century. Um, so I guess I have two questions. One is simply, does the argument leading to the abolition of slavery pick up any of the strands of the earlier debate. Um, I, I, as you said, I, um, you know, once you take God out of the equation, things become more, more complicated. But what, what, what is the discourse leading to the abolition? Does it connect in any way with this early debate? And, and how do you see the, the, you know, um, the, the case of Napoleon and, and, and Haiti and, and, and the indemnity? Mm -hmm. um. So I, I think that it 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 connects in interesting ways, but that um, there is something of a rupture uh, between um, Laba writing in the you know 1750s, 1720s, 1730s, uh, and uh, the encyclopedist, and then the abolitionists uh, like Condorcet or, or Renan. Um, Condorcet and Renal will, will target penal slavery uh, most aggressively. Uh, I think perhaps because they realize that it remains the most sort of compelling argument that, um, that uh, pro-slavery thinkers have been able to put forward. And uh, partly because they can then look back to, uh, you know, to the Romans and th there's such a, um, and, you know, there are plenty of passages, uh, theological passages that support that type of slavery. They have natural. So um, there is a kind of um, um, the, the abolitionists focus on that so greatly. Uh, but um, interestingly, the, the debate does become more and more about property uh, because um, in the sort of second half of the 18th century and even near the end, uh, you have a number of thinkers who seek to justify slavery and who will stop using theological arguments about, you know, the fact that the Europeans are converting the Africans and saving their souls and will sort of give up on some of the other arguments about just war, et cetera, but will instead um, say quite explicitly, um, we need people who have the physical strength um, to uh, work in these plantations and uh, the Native Americans or the, the indigenous people there and the whites don't seem able to do so. And so whether this is right or wrong from a moral standpoint is irrelevant um, because from a purely economic standpoint, uh, it is the only solution. Um, and then of course, always sort of wrapped into this claim that if we stop the other European powers will continue to do so. Um, so we won't really make much of a difference except that they'll surpass us economically and, and uh, militarily. 
And so there, there's um, the, the kind of the property aspect becomes, it gets pushed, you know, to, to, the, to, to the center of the discussion. Um, but, but it doesn't, um, it replaces, it, it, I guess maybe becomes so transparent that in a way you no longer need the discourse of vigilantism to conceal it. So I'm, you know, I think in the 1730s and before what I'm trying to claim is that there's a discourse of justice, of vigilantism that is being used um, hypocritically to try to obscure the fact that this is all about property. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the century, I think everyone knows that it's all about property. Yeah. 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 And, and, and Haiti? Haiti, the example, I mean, that the, the yeah. French state was still accepting an indemnity in the 20th century. I, I just, I found that absolutely, I mean, talk about unethical, huh? <laughs> That's shocking. And, and, and Condorcet, uh, as early as I think 1784, writes uh, a, a, a long text about the um, calling for the abolition of slavery. And he has a chapter at the very end that says, should we indemnify uh, slave owners who are about to lose their property. Um, and he comes out very aggressively with a resounding no. Um, and so I, I agree the fact that um, that property remains central, but that in some weird way, those who were enslaved continue to pay uh, no longer through their own physical labor or, th or through their freedom, but but continue to pay nevertheless um, money to their enslavers is, is um, shocking. Yeah. Um, we have a question from uh, Masano. Um, great to see you again. Um, thanks for joining. Um, would you like to ask this directly? Uh, sure. Um, thank you, Jan. Your project has already evolved so much. Um, um, since the last time I heard you speak on your topic. And so kind of picking up on um, some of the, um, your thoughts from earlier, I was curious to know if you've come across um, any female vigilantes since we were talking about. And I'm wondering if you th if whether you think if gender will, will, will play a role in sort of the story you're telling about people taking justice into their own hands. And in particular, um, in terms of history, I was wondering if you've come, if you came across anything regarding women um, during the French Revolution, uh, if there were, or maybe prior to that, were there any female, you know, radicals taking justice into their own hands? Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, I, I have not yet found um, a single female vigilante, at least in the 18th century. I haven't looked much beyond there. Um, I see Ray says Charlotte Cordois. And um, yes, I think I, I, it's, it's always hard once you get into the revolution because it becomes so explicitly um, politicized, right? Where, um, uh, but I agree. I think Charlotte Cordois, I've, I've, I've thought about looking at Charlotte Cordois, um, Cordé, but partly because um, it, it's an interesting sort of situation in which um, Maha could also be seen as a vigilante of sorts uh, because at, at the very least an encourager of vigilantism uh, through his journal that, that um, and he truly considered L'Ami du Peuple to be um, a journal that was supposed to not only disclose crimes, but um, participate in their inquests. And he encouraged people who had been accused within the journal to send in a response. And sometimes you would have multiple responses, people counter, uh, um, counterattacking each other uh, until at the very end he sort of gave his verdict. And so th there's a there's a way in which he himself is a vigilante. And um, it's interesting to think uh, then of the possibility that that Corday is, is is then uh, her taking on the role of vigilante but destroying a vigilante. So uh, it's not something I've researched or, or written about, but I, I do think that that might work as an example. Um, I wondered if there might be an interesting um, a connection or a way of thinking about um, the relationship between women and violence 
And I recall, you know, in your earlier presentation, um, you were giving these examples of American men. They were always men. Um, so I thought that perhaps uh, historically there's a very specific relationship um, as women, as violent um, agents. Um, so some, something along those lines. Yeah. I think, um, so, I mean, I can, I, I think I've come across incidents where it was um, self-defense. Um, you can even sort of, if you kind of stretch the definition of vigilantism and you start to think, well, incidents of, of defending family honor, then you can find women in literature um, who, who might um, fit the bill of, of vigilantism. But I think they're very few. And uh, I suspect that it has to do with the fact that like the African slaves, they were at the time considered to be part of the uh, property less, and in some ways, whether or not they had actual property. But, um, you know, Elsa Dornan in her book talks about property less as being a bigger category that has to do with not having uh, property, not having one's own body, uh, not having ownership over one's own body. So um, it, it goes beyond simply wealth to be a, a matter of agency and, and of sort of uh, legal recognition as a subject. Um, and um, and she has in that book a sort of chapter near the end that deals with debates surrounding uh, feminism in America and um, how far should uh, feminists, you know, should they be open to uh, the use of violence? Um, and it's, it's so, you know, but a lot of that is much later. I think that in the 18th century, um, I haven't come any, across any, and I suspect that it has to do both with their position within society and with certain ideas, uh, gendered ideas of, um, you know, who is entitled to be violent and who is not, uh, and women would not be. Thank you. Um, I believe I saw um, Diane, you had your hand up. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Prof. Robert. Um, I wanted to say, um, partly to underline what Jean Ireland said, what is some things that are shocking. It's also shocking to me, speaking of penal slavery, that it is still in the U.S. Constitution, 13th Amendment. Penal slavery is part of our culture here and our constitution. So it, I do feel it's very relevant. And I think that point is getting more attention um, right now these days. Um, I wanted to ask you what you're going to do with the Count of Monte Cristo. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that it's written by Alexandre Dumas. And I still don't know exactly his background in relationship to um, colonial slavery. Um, I started to read his book, George, but never finished. But I'm wondering what, how you see that. I mean, because it does seem kind of like the Batman commercial pop culture um, take on it. So wh what do you see there? Um, all right, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I will say first about your comment relating to penal slavery. I haven't had the time to do this yet, but um, of course, penal slavery in France in the 18th century and before it isn't, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't call it slavery exactly, but there are moments uh, among uh, people who are trying to abolish um, slavery. Uh, Renal is one of them. Renal says um, we need to stop transporting, uh, you know, Africans uh, because we're not doing it under the right you know, we're doing it under false pretenses. We are, in fact, uh, abducting and enslaving them. And he says, and, and he wants to respond to the question of um, that I mentioned earlier of, of uh, all these people saying, well, there is, in fact, uh, no way for the, the colonies to thrive without the, the hard labor of, um, of Africans. And he says, well, no, what we need to do is simply uh, change our... Uh, you know, justice system in France so that uh, instead of ever having capital punishment, what we do is we send our convicts over 
to serve as, and the reason I say they're not exactly slaves, and he says they're not exactly slaves, is because he would set it, you know, a, a fixed time. So 10 years, 15 years, depending on the crime. But he, he tries to uh, essentially rethink what was um, the, the galleys and say, instead of having, uh, you know, forced labor as a, penal, as a penalty, we will have it uh, sent to um, the colonies. And so th there's a way in which he's trying to, to replace slavery with a kind of, of, of acceptable penal slavery, one that already existed, the galleys. Um, and so, I mean, you're right, we still have that and we still, to some extent, I mean, we may not, but as a society, we still consider it legitimate. Um, and then as far as your question about the Count of Monte Cristo, I've been sort of debating whether it should um, find its way in a sort of conclusion. Um, I haven't reread it yet. Uh, as you know, it's a very long book. And so my plan is to look at it this summer. Um, but, um, but I've had a number of people you know, mention it and it, it, it seems like it has to show up somewhere. Uh, but I, at the moment, imagine finishing the book uh, near the end of the revolution, uh, possibly looking at uh, Haiti. Um, and, but I could see it being this sort of very nice conclusion um, to sort of look at the sort of the aftermath of, uh, in French literature in particular, of this vigilante figure um, and to try to, you know, reflect on how that might be very different from uh, the 18th century text that I'm looking at. Um, we have a question from Joel Metellus. I think you're muted. You are muted. Joel, you're muted. Excusez-moi, ouais. Bon, oui, professeur, et dans quelle mesure vous pourriez considérer le récent mouvement uh, sur la scène politique américaine et QAnon? Uh, mm. comme uh, du vigilantisme, mm. uh, du fait qu'ils se réclament, bon, ils veulent lutter contre la disposition du nouveau régime qui serait, et par exemple, des choses, euh, ils, ils favoriseraient l'avortement, mais eux, ils, surtout l'ancien régime qui se, qui se fait passer, ou il se faisait passer comme <rire> quelqu'un qui défend les lois naturelles de Dieu et tout des choses comme ça. Alors, comment, dans quelle mesure vous considériez ce, ce mouvement comme euh, du euh, vigilantisme? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that's a good question. I'll answer in English because I, I don't want to assume everyone understands French in the audience, but um, it's a good question about QAnon and the ways in which it might be a form of vigilantism. Um, my sort of immediate response would be that in, in uh, vigilante studies at the moment, um, it's, it's a, you know, relatively small field, but it's, it's one that is uh, spreading. And what you have um, is what I've sort of noticed is that there used to be, let's say about 20, 30 years ago, it was dominated the, the field of vigilante studies by um, historians uh, often focused on the American Revolution and, and those years, and then also sort of, you know, obviously lynching and everything that happens in the 19th century, the rise of the KKK. So there was kind of that historical focus. Uh, and then about 10, 15 years ago, you had the criminologist who became very interested in, in questions of how to define it and how it might relate to the state. But in the past five to 10 years, there's been more and more interest in uh, what they're calling digital vigilantism, which is the sort of the, the, the rise of a type of vigilantism that is, um, that happens primarily online and that may not lead to an actual execution. Although in the case of QAnon, um, certainly it, it's, it, it's inflaming violence and therefore may lead to death. But, but the focus isn't always on, on, on that. It's, it's more so on the way that, um, the, the, the digital world we inhabit might actually encourage a certain type of vigilantism. Um, and so, you know, could we count QAnon 
as vigilantism. I think if we're looking at it from with using the rather narrow definition that I'm that I'm proposing, um, where there needs to be that kind of investigation of a crime and there needs to be that execution or that punishment. It doesn't have to be death, I suppose, but an enforcing of the law. I think that's the other thing is that a vigilante in my mind genuinely seeks to enforce existing laws uh, where the justice system appears to be unable to. And it doesn't mean that the laws are just, because as I tried to show, quite often these laws are not in fact just, uh, just as the, the, the laws of the Code Noir are in no way just. But the vigilante is working within the, the, the confines of the system, uh, but acting extrajudicially. Um, I think QAnon fits more into the category of conspiracy theories um, with no real claim to be enforcing any kind of law. Um, but you do, but it fits into this sort of rise of a kind of digital vigilantism that um, is in some ways even more widespread and dangerous because um, it's relatively risk-free and um, the, the digital world gives a type of anonymity that you know the cobbler in Lab story doesn't really have. And the cobbler will eventually get caught. And in fact, he turns himself in partly because he will get caught. Uh, but QAnon can continue to spread as long as people are interested in it without any real risk to those spreading those, those uh, lies. So, so that's where I would look, if that's sort of an interest to you, is to, to kind of look at the recent articles about the way that the digital world is transforming vigilantism. Um, Jan, we have a question about some spelling of words, and I noticed that in the transcript, some of these are really getting kind of garbled, and could you spell, I mean, one for me that is um, not coming through is Laba, um, can you maybe type that into chat? Um, and Jean, if there were others that you're catching, um, do feel free to let us know. Um, and Jan could just clarify for us. Yeah, I was, I was terrified. I turned off the uh, transcripts because I thought it would be, <laughs> uh, it would really mangle a lot of names. Um, but yes, Jean-Baptiste Laba. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, that the term Laba still exists in, in, in Creole, apparently in, in uh, Creole Martinique, uh, and means, uh, and, and I don't know which one it is, it means an esprit malin, which can both be translated as, as a sort of evil spirit or a clever, shrewd, intelligent spirit. But uh, apparently the, the phrase per Laba in Creole um, is still used pretty commonly. And so he's, and, and there's a lot of, um, if you're, into rum, uh, he a lot of his books are about the sort of the the use of sugar canes and the distillation of rum, and and there are still several brands that are the sort of laba rum. Um, but I'm wondering, okay, could you put that in? Could you just write it in chat? Oh, that got, I'm sorry, that I did, but it got sent to Massano only. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, no, no. Just, there we go. Okay. It's, it's my fault. And thank you, Rose. Um, so yes, that I, I had done it and um, assumed that it was sent to everybody. Uh, okay. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, yeah. And if people have questions about other ones that didn't come through, feel free um, to ask. That was the one that I caught. Hi. Hey. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Jan. And I just have a very different kind of question, which is the I just was quite taken with those images of the 
or the image of the sort of natural law tribunal mm -hmm. um, in, in wherever is it Ethiopia or something, um, and then you compared it to the to the King Louis the Ninth of France, and I mean those pictures look quite different to me, right? Because the one is it. I don't know if you want to pull them up. I, I took a screenshot, um, but the um, you know the um, the, there are there is somebody holding a sword <laughs> over the kind of um, the person who's who's looking for mercy um, in the one in the French one, right? And there's a cross, and and there are there's a whole infrastructure, there's a whole sort of um, yeah infrastructure of kind of people who are going to make sure this this thing works. Whereas the the one the sort of romantic one from uh, Africa from La Baz, like um, everyone's looking away. You know, these 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 people are looking away, and then the kind of um, sovereign is almost like having a you know a, like a personal little conversation with with these two figures. And I don't know. That seems that seems really different. And 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 um, uh, I'm just. I don't, I'm just wondering what, what, how this is an ideal, how it's imagined as an ideal of natural law. Right. I think, I mean, so I see what you mean about the, the distinctions. Um, what, what I was struck with was the, uh, obviously the setting. And uh, to this day, um, people in France still talk about the good uh, saint -Louis. Uh, giving justice under his oak tree. And there's this sort of obsession with the oak tree and the fact that he would do it outside and that he would actually do it directly. In fact, um, and, and so the, the you know, I, I, the, the, this, the link I saw was with this, um, the way that Laba is going to take a um, topos uh, of a kind of early form of natural justice and uh, apply it to um, the Africans. Um, and it's, I mean, there's a win which, so, so um, uh, San Louis, in fact, is, is known uh, in France for having put an end to the uh, tradition of the trial by ordeal um, and by having replaced this particular form of medieval justice uh, in which, you know, as you know, it's two champions facing each other and, and um, you know, the one who survives is, is proven innocent because God chose uh, that he would survive um, or that he would vanquish. Um, and he replaces it by uh, stating, from now on, anyone can come to me and present their case and I will listen to it. And regardless of your social status, um, all of you are welcome to my sort of open air court uh, tribunal. And it's, um, it becomes kind of a legend that during the attempt to reform the justice system in France in the 18th century, uh, people often point back to, to say, uh, instead of our current system, which is very inquisitorial, uh, not debate-based, which is very much... Um, uh, and it's entirely based on, on writing, on transcription, um, we need to return to this particular model. Um, and so in, in my in Dramatic Justice, in my book, I talk about the fact that this model is in many ways theatrical and that there's an attempt to bring it back uh, as being superior to the write, writing-based um, model that uh, you find in inquisitorial uh, justice. Um, what is interesting with Laba is that um, a lot of his descriptions, he's borrowing, as I mentioned, from the Italian priest, uh, Cavazzi. And Cavazzi has something like 80 pages describing the fact that, according to him, the Africans used trial by ordeal. And he has very long, I mean, it's, it's, it's mm. essentially torture, what he's describing, um, where, you know, the, these, and I have no idea how accurate it is historically, but what what he's describing are different forms of torture in which if someone can, you know, push through the pain um, and, and not crack and not confess guilt, then um, that becomes, that, that is uh, equivalent to being innocent. And Cavazzi attacks this and say, well, look how backwards they are. Uh, we no longer, we used to have a system like that, but now we know better. 
And so Cavazzi has a very, as like a, a traditional notion of the evolution of justice as one based on progress, saying, look, the Africans are where we used to be back in the Middle Ages, and they're stuck there. We are now superior and wiser, and we're going to bring to them um, the way that just, you know, the, the, the conventions of a, a better form of justice. And Laba, who's read all this, instead takes out all the stuff about trial by ordeal and focuses only on this image uh, and finds a kind of another link to a uh, medieval form of justice, but one that existed for a very brief period of time in France, and that is the the the, um, the forms of trial that that uh, uh, Saint Louis Saint Louis uh, introduced. So, um, so I think it, I mean I didn't have time to go into it in my in my talk, but I'm seeing almost as as uh, Laba is deliberately kind of flipping the narrative and saying, well, Cavazzi has a progress based we are superior to the Africans. And he says, well, actually, no, if you go back far enough, we Frenchmen also had this kind of natural justice outside, simple, no lawyers, nothing of the sort. And we lost it. And yet, and the Africans have kept it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I mean, it's very convincing. I think I was just, you know, you do have the sword and the, like, you have more sort of instruments of um, implementation of power in the French image. Um, and then you have, of course, the, I mean, just the looking away of the, of the, you know, figures is quite interesting to me. But I mean, you, it's absolutely convincing that, you know, what you're saying. I mean, I, I plan to, um, when I'm reworking this chapter to include the images, um, which I stumbled across um, three days ago while trying to put together a PowerPoint. <laughs> and so, um, and, and so what you're saying is really helpful because you're right, they're, they're not exactly the same. Um, there's a kind of, you know, clear link. Um, and I should also say that this particular image of uh, San Luis is um, you know dates from 1933, and mm -hmm. so I picked it partly because it, it was sort of the clearest where you could see the tree and so forth. But it might be more useful for me to actually look at a medieval representation, uh, even if it doesn't map quite as well on the one from Laba, uh, because this is also, I mean, I would say that this image, as you mentioned with the source and everything else, to me uh, reads like an image created in the 1900s with the uh, to fit the expectations of their readership as to what uh, people in the medieval times would have looked at would have looked like um, so I don't know how accurate that image is uh, as a representation of of uh, San Louis dispensing justice thank you <laughs> thank you again so much Jan for such a stimulating talk um, and thanks to everyone for joining us for this discussion um, it's been a great year and a great way to close off the year with this um, wonderful discussion of your work um, I hope that everyone here will join us for our humanities day we have a couple of events that are coming up so do look up on our website for the full schedule on our April 28th Humanities Day and for um, the remainder of events at the Institute. Thank you, Jan.